Hello. Um, actually, it was very difficult to follow such a great speech earlier. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what, I, what I do. I'm just going to give you a quick summary. Uh, I'm Indy Johar, part of a collective that's called The Hub, which has been growing all over the world. It started in 2004 uh, in Islington, has gone to 28 locations around the world. It's not centrally owned by us. It's a club for social entrepreneurs, which has gone around. And I think what we've done is prove globalization in a different way. It goes from San Francisco to London to Vienna to Sao Paulo, all over the world in about four years. And we didn't do it like Starbucks, which I'm really pleased about. But in a sense, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about um, some reflections that I'm having over the last sort of two years. We're building a new hub in London and various other things. But I don't really want to talk too much about the hub per se but some of the reflections of it. And in a sense, in a way, the big do and the sort of uh, the, many micro, uh, the, the micro many do, very much taking forward from uh, some of the stuff that you were talking about. The big do, I'm going to give you big, three stories from my life where I experienced the big do. Detroit, 2010. I was fortunate enough to go out there and actually had a look at sort of, uh, went to the sort of, um, Ford Museum. And it was worth just walking around and having a think and reflecting on what Ford did. Ford was one of these kind of very interesting people, quite a remarkable person. Everyone remembers Ford, but very few people remember he built awesome teams around him, some of the best finances and very, very many things. But one of the other things he did was he obviously built Model T Ford and various other T Fords. But what he also did was change the nature of production and change the nature of consumption. So he, I mean, he, when he started to build cars, one of the things that happened was that when people started to build cars, his retention rates of people staying, wanting to work for him was about 50%. Every week, people would leave. More than 50% of people would leave. And he thought, this is a disaster. Because the work was very, you know, he said, I want you to do this one action again and again and again and again and again and again. His retention rates were poor. So he doubled the wages, right? So imagine... Just said, right, I'm going to double the wages. Off the back of that doubling, his retention rates dropped. But a few years later, you started to see cars changed. Cars changed from being this kind of mechanical object to being something which was about actually your personality. It was about buying into an icon, a semiotic. Now, what I found fascinating about that, just seeing the range of cars that they changed, was that you could see, from my perspective, one really clear example of how we'd gone from the product being a mechanical service thing to being something which was about fulfilling people. So people, as their work had become diminished from purpose, had suddenly started to consume to absorb purpose. And I found that amazing. That was it. That was one of the first times we'd moved in my, and I could see the cars. You could literally just see them in front of them. It's not the first, he's not the only person to have done it. Many people have done it. Now, in a way, that whole thing of depurposing work, taking the purpose away from people's work, and saying you can, perp you can buy purpose, buy purpose in how your car looks and various other things, was one of the first things for me about this idea of the big do, the big corporate do. What was it doing? My second experience of it was practice. I, I trained as an architect, and um, during that time, I... I I worked for a very, very good London practice, and we went from 17 people to about 70 people. When we were 17 people, we did handrails with nodules on them because we were working for pe people with early stages of Alzheimer's and various other problems, and we really understood this idea of, actually, the, the idea of memory and sequences of memory, and when memory lapses had happened, we even chose different smells of wood to allow people to effectively get deep ideas of, of the memory of the spaces and various other things. When we became 70-odd, 70 75-odd, we started to take sketches drawn by one person, and they got turned into buildings. So what had happened was something that was deeply relational and deeply thought through in relation to the context and the user had suddenly become an image which was being transmuted through a factory line. And this isn't their fault. This was something about going on in this size and scale. And that was my genuine personal experience of going from 17, same people, great people as well, the founders hadn't changed. They hadn't become evil overnight. But something about the process of scale had done something to them. 
And in a way, what it articulated to me was about this idea of the diseconomies of scale. Scale isn't always, uh, isn't always this magical thing, and it actually takes away a lot of power and resilience. And, and the third story I'd like to say is I trained as an architect in Bath. I spent seven years uh, out in Bath. And one of the things I sort of, sort of always, and we'd been growing up in this kind of knowledge economy myth. You know, everyone goes, it's the knowledge economy. Everyone will be knowledge workers. Everyone will be great. And then when I used to go to site, what I used to realize was I was telling the bricky what brick to use, what mortar joints to use, where the wall would be, what brick patterns to use. Actually, I was taking away power from the people at the end. So actually, what the knowledge economy had been largely doing was empowering me. It was effectively taking away craft and empowering the few. So this idea of the knowledge economy being this ubiquitous thing was actually the knowledge economy for the few. And you know, there's a whole myth, the cappuccino workers in, in the, middle of the middle of the kind of cool offices all over London. It was about empowering a few. And so this idea of the kind of um, the big do, well, it was a big do for the very few. And everyone else was being automated in, in, a, in a fashion. And in a sense, I suppose what we've been seeing over the last few years is some really interesting trends, right? So I would, I mean, this is kind of very simple stuff. And, you know, in a way, how we moved from the idea of the social state, the private state, to the kind of social economy or the civic economy, where you have power being decentralized to citizens. You have effectively resources like Kickstarter, platforms being built, various other things. I mean, I was at IBM recently, and it was fascinating because we were talking about IT platforms. And what they openly admitted was actually the IT platforms that most citizens have are way in advance of what most corporates have. So you know, corporates don't get access to Kickstarter. They don't have the mechanisms. They don't have access to Facebook. They're banned from largely using it. Twitter, various other things that actually are platforms for citizen economies are actually empowering a new way of doing. And various other things. We just did the, the Wiki House, which we launched recently, which is effectively looking at how we could start to print housing using CNC, CNC milling and automate it using Google SketchUp. And we just launched it, I think, literally about two days ago. And it went you know, all over the world in South Korea. So there's new ways of even authorship. What is the role of the Arctic? What is the role of my IP? What is the role of collaboration? And what is the kind of differentiation between the professional and the amateur? And how is that blurring? There's, so, there's amazing stuff going on. And in a way, this kind of big corporate, sort of powerful uh, sort of hegemony of the few, we were sort of talking yesterday about there's, well, there's four major banks that control most of the financing. There's about six major energy companies, four major f uh, sort of supermarkets. This whole idea of the kind of monopolistic, cap uh, monopolistic capitalism that we've grown into is starting to be opened up by platforms like Kickstarter, I hope, by platforms like The Hub and various other things. These are new environments that start to create this micro-many. And I think there's something, there's something really rather amazing going on. Civic economy, it's, and when you go small, you take more in, in detailed responsibility for what you're doing. So like my point about the handrail, we took deep responsibility about the handrail because we knew what its purpose was. It's one of the last memories to go, the tactile memory, and how we were understanding it. So you start to talk about pu public good in a different way. So it's real. Hub, we've already talked about. I'm going to shoot through. Brooklyn Superhero Store, some of you know about this. 8 to 6 Valencia. Amazing stuff that's going on all over the world. Again, it's a new type of, they've, they're spreading, they're growing. Uh, Ed, uh, David Ed Edgars has come to London as well. So um, uh, do most of you know this? Should I explain it? No, yeah. No, no, no. OK. So, um, the story of it is really good. You should look it up on Ted because he does a really good speech about it. But one of the things that's really impressive about it is uh, there were a bunch of writers who wanted to turn around and help people, uh, help, help children learn how to uh, like read and write. And they came together. They wanted to take over a super, uh, store. And the planning zone, uh, planning zone basically said, you can't take over the store. You've got, it's got to be a retail store. And they turned around and said, oh, it's got to be a retail store? OK. So they turned around and effectively created a retail store for superhero sales. And at the front of the store, really remarkable products. And at the back of it, they actually had a writer's workshop and a print, print facility. So kids were coming in, writing, writing with writers, selling their books, selling their stuff, and really enthusing, uh, enthusing about developing a new economy. The writers were doing it out of passion. Kids were getting involved. And there was this new virtuous economy. This idea of the kind of amateur and the professional were blurring. 
nicely. And I think that's one of the things that we're starting to see. Uh, incredible, uh, incredible Edible Todd, Todd Morden, again, taking your public domain stuff and starting to live it, uh, starting to turn it into uh, planting, uh, planting food, food all across, across the public realm. Lots of amazing stuff going on. Rutland Telecoms, this was amazing, right? So Rutland, um, so this is a, a village, this has got the fastest broadband, uh, rural broadband in the country. Right? They raised, I think it was raised 8,000 pounds to effectively put in that box because BT wouldn't do it. The villagers raised it themselves. They've now got the fastest broadband. They get 7% return. So what is happening is that infrastructure is getting small. As our, as our infrastructure gets small, we can start to fund it, finance it ourselves. We don't need the hegemony of the big to do that. And that, for me, is really exciting. Bicycle. I think why I use this example is this isn't about new pro-localism, right? This isn't about us just becoming hyper-local. It's also becoming hyper-global. This is a bicycle uh, repair shop in, in Denmark that's been transporting its bikes after, the, after they used it out to Ghana and various other places and training people up there as well as effectively uh, build, uh, return, building bikes out there and bringing it back. So we can create new virtuous economies. The global model no longer has to be one or two people. And it has, doesn't have to be a corporate. Actually, very small organizations can go global in a really ethical and powerful way. And I think that's going to be our challenge for the next few years is how do we go, go global in a kind of new sense. PlayStation, which, uh, again, civic a real estate platform that's been built with locality, and they're doing some rather amazing stuff around it, how we start to share our resources in a rather amazing way. Key behaviors, sure, moving from big finance to lots of microfinance, and we've got lots of examples of that. Many, many stakeholders, this idea of the mythical single patron, myth mythical single actor, this blurring of the customer, the investor, and various other things, that's all key part of the story. Sharing. So in 2006, the myth was that we could all buy our BMW. Now the challenge is how do we, you know, and we could have 10 BMWs. Now if we have five, how do we share it? And I have a bit of warning about this as well later. And it is global. You know, Community Kitchen started off in Australia, really amazing stuff that happened. And again, it spread through the internet, people supporting each other, and went global. And, and been doing stuff all over the world. And one of the key things about it is this idea, and we were having this conversation a couple of days ago uh, in a different context, is it isn't about one person being creative and the other person being the accountant, right? This is about all of us starting to actually blur these skills and take deep responsibility around some of these things and not about the special, super specialization of individuals. It's not about community building or building, a community, building for a community. It's about blurring this thing. I increasingly don't use, don't hate the term marketing. It's not about marketing. It's about how you build communities around things, how you build networks and relationships around things. Citizens, the platform, and in a way, the new way. All sounds good, right? This is great. Yeah, we love it. But there's some challenges. And I, in a sense, that's the challenges that I'm facing, honestly, today. So we all have the dreams of the 21st century, and I think we all do, and we all share them. But actually, more and more, what you find is that people re reach a certain age, certain point in their life, certain questions. There's some real deep questions about the desires and wants of kind of the 20th century start to reemerge. Actually, affording a house, good schools. And yes, these things are being opened up, but I think we should just recognize, actually, there's, we're still living in a legacy age, and there are some real challenges in that. Ownership and governance. The whole HuffPost thing, where actually many, many bloggers were writing content, and effectively it was sold off uh, to AOL. Uh, it's a recent gag was anyone can sell anything to AOL. But, um, <laughs> but in a sense, that really showed a real, and there was a huge outcry about it, and there is. It starts to show when you blur this amateur and this professional thing, this idea of ownership and go governance is really questionable. Who owns what, really? And I don't think, personally, we're struggling with it. How do we start to actually talk about a new form of ownership which genuinely bridges those boundaries and doesn't allow a 20th century idea of ownership and governance to effectively pollute these models? And we need to take care about that. Because I, I think we're still using the old models around ownership. And we're struggling with it, right? The hub is a CIC. Right? It's, uh, it's got four equity investors right now in it. And I would think, well, do we really own it? 
How do we really govern it? Can we sell it? How about all the time that people have put in to make it happen? How do we value that? How do we equate that? And if we, and if we sell it, do we actually destroy it in the act of doing it? So I think there's some deep questions, and I really don't know the answers. So I really I, I find them challenging. And in a way, the first story is me, right? I'm 37. I find that challenging. You know, my child, my three-year-old, what do I do? You know, and I think it's really important to sort of, you know, what are the expectations? And in a sense, this was my experience of London Zoo. And, it, and I had a very interesting conversation. I tweeted straight after I'd been to London Zoo. I, walk, I was about to leave, and I was invited to walk out. And I had to walk out through, effectively, a sales shop. And I went, hold it, but you're a charity and I'm a member. I said, yes. But you have to walk through this shop. And you couldn't. You literally couldn't see the way out. And, what, and I sort of ended up having, I've got some, I had a very good friend, Catherine Hudson, phoned her up. She's, she's very interesting around this stuff. And she said, look, they're a single outcome organization. Their only responsibility is to the animals. They can do all that because they don't have a public good responsibility. And I was like, I don't expect a charity to behave like this. This idea of the single outcome organization is just not the corporates, it's everywhere. We're dealing with a real legacy issue here. And I think we've got a real challenge on our hands. And a story about stories. Be careful about stories. Streetcar is not the sharing economy. Streetcar is the economic rent economy. Big corporates, big finances own, own the asset and we will just use it. We have to be careful that we don't allow language to slip, slip away with ourselves. Either we want to become an economic rent seeker economy where we're effectively all living in a new serfdom of the medieval age, or we want a genuine sharing economy where we share our assets with each other. And this is a pivotal moment in that story. And I think we have to be genuinely careful and not allow these conversations to blur. And we have to be on our guard. I'm not saying we, I know, I'm just knowing that these issues are real. This is not a panacea, right? This is all good stuff and I really love what we're doing. But let's not just imagine this is going to be heaven at the end of it. There are going to be new challenges. We know already that sort of very small advantages in terms of inheritory wealth, I mean very small, like micro small advantages in inheritory wealth has huge impacts in this sort of economy. New ideas, new ways of talking about fairness and equality are going to have to be rethought through. So I love what we're doing. But let's also walk in there with the eyes wide open on this one. Because there are going to be a brand new set of challenges and brand new set of questions. Thank you.